I believe the same level in the field of technology and communications. It was fascinating this evening, a, a German colleague walked up to me and he gave me something. Can, can you stand up and just introduce yourself? So he gave me this interview that he did in 1998, when I had fled. I'm still trying to get home, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> getting there soon, getting there soon. Things are changing. But a lot has changed since that time. And I'm extremely hopeful about the change that will build Africa's century. But there's no, no, no nation or continent that ever lifted itself up without a major transformation in the field of agriculture. I might be a telecommunications entrepreneur, but I'm here to tell you today that ground zero in our transformation and change must be in agriculture. It is the surest, inclusive path that we can take to begin to address most of the challenges that face us, whether they be economic, political, or security. I shared this earlier on today with some of our colleagues, how I traveled to Mali with our late brother Kofi Annan, and as we were walking around in rural Mali, we made three key observations that, the three of, that we later discussed in our delegation. Most of the farmers were women. 70% of Africa's farmers are women. And most of them were middle-aged or older. At the same time, we, so our young people are not farming. At the same time, as my colleague rightly pointed out, we are importing $70 billion worth of food every year. We also observed while we were walking around in rural Mali that young men were roaming around. And Kofi Annan, who once headed UN's Peace and Security Commission, immediately pointed out to me, he said, that is trouble. Six months did not go by before Mali was thrown into a great crisis. You could not go today to the places that we drove just outside the Malian capital. It was almost overrun. The third observation we made came from the people themselves. They said, our crops are not growing. The seasons are changing. Scientists are debating, I'm told. Well, I think the scientists aren't debating, but the politicians are debating. Scientists call it climate change. I learned about it in Mali. So we may have to send a few of our leaders there to go and learn about climate change. So, we are faced with extraordinary challenges, but we also have some opportunities, and I believe that the lowest hanging fruit for us lies with agriculture. Fortunately, even though, as Kofi Annan used to say, Africa is the only region of the world that did not have a green revolution. The United States had a green revolution. Japan had a green revolution. Europe had a green revolution. Asia had a green revolution. But Africa did not have a green revolution. And that is what must seize us with a great urgency today. 
Africa's green revolution has begun. But to complete that, it will need your generation. Here I'm talking to the young Africans and their colleagues. Because we will not be able to do it alone. We will need the help of our friends. I'm here this week in Berlin because we were invited here to have our, the board meeting of AGRA. The last time I was here, I was with Kofi Annan. And we came a delegation to see the chancellor. And she spent the better part of an hour. Oh, I see the picture. That funny looking guy is our friend who sang Band-Aid. Remember him? Hmm? Bob Geldof. But here's the thing. Bob Geldof, this was the Africa Progress Panel. And we went to see Angela Merkel because she had invited us to talk about what we could do. And we said, let's partner. Let's work in agriculture. Bob Geldof sang, led the Band-Aid. Hunger in Ethiopia. A member of our board is the former prime minister of Ethiopia, Haile Mariam. It cannot happen today because we have made progress. Does it mean that we don't have children going to bed hungry? Yes, we do. But we have made progress, but we have to complete the job. And that is why I'm here to appeal to you. Join us. Now, that doesn't mean I want you all to be all farmers, but it wouldn't be so bad. It wouldn't harm you. <laughs> we at Agra, over the last 12 years, have tried to build a platform with African governments aimed at catalyzing, you call it today, being an accelerator to African agricultural transformation. We look at the entire value chain. We are completely persuaded that Africa's green revolution will take place. Our real focus is how will it take place? We believe that the center to a successful and sustainable green revolution in Africa is the smallholder farmer. As a businessman, I like to know my customer. In this mission, my customer is the smallholder farmer. How we are focused on how do we increase their productivity? How do we increase the incomes that they are generating? How do we help them produce more food and get more food to market. It's not enough to produce more food. They have to be able to get that food to market. They have to be able to get the correct prices for that food. How do I know? Because that's what they told us they want. Because we're interested in what they want. Not what we want for them, but what they want. What they told us when we were walking in rural Mali. And that's what we've been saying to our partners. Help us to help them. Support us to help them. That meeting was part of a process that has gone for a number of years. My dear friend, who's standing in the very corner there, came all the way here. Please stand up, Peter, and say hello. So Peter Eigen. <laughs> so Peter Eigen is a member of the Africa Progress Panel. Because with all these things, we need to be partners. Some of you have been sent here by my good friend, Professor Joachim van Braun, who couldn't be here with us. But these are champions 
of a, of a global citizenship that we must all work on together. Now that global citizenship is not about just smallholder farmers. It also includes civil society. One of the things Kofi Annan always insisted, and it was new to me, I must admit. He says, you know, you gotta let these civil society guys in the room and let them shout at you. You're gonna learn something. He taught us to have respect for the voice of civil society. We're happy to engage and discuss and include you, just like we, we, we finance farmers' organizations so that farmers themselves can be organized for what they need. You know in Europe, you, the farmers are organized. Some would say too organized, but they're organized. We want our farmers to be organized. But at the end of the day, it's not donor funding that will develop African agriculture. We are the first to tell you here now, okay? It is about government policies in Africa, committed governments, committed African leaders, progressive African leaders. And when those progressive African leaders have retired, We've gone to get them out of retirement and say, it didn't say retire, it meant new tires. One of them is His Excellency President Kikwete who sits on our board and I recognize him here with us this evening. Thank you, sir. As, as leader of Tanzania, he, he was one of the champions on the global stage that enabled us to build this platform as are many others, my brother Kanayo Kawanze, who's sitting right here, uh, who's run IFAD, uh, and so many others that are here that form part of this board. So, without much ado, let's have a conversation, shall we? Thank you very much, Germany. We appreciate your support and your commitment. We know with this great locomotive called Germany now thugging behind us, Africa's future can only be brighter. Thank you for your kind remarks. Now, the time has come for you, Zuyu Zayuz. Our moderator tonight is Mr. Fred Swanike. He is also a Ghanaian entrepreneur and as a founder and the chairman of Africa Leadership Academy, Mr. Swaniker is another inspirational leader for many African youth. He was nominated World Economic Forum Young Global Leader in 2012 and one of the top 10 young powerful men in Africa by Forbes magazine. So I really encourage you to share your thoughts, what's on your mind with these inspirational leaders. Use the opportunity, please. Thank you, Fred Frostier. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in, uh, in, uh, in, in Berlin. And uh, thank you strive for, uh, for those wonderful remarks. And also, I want to make a special shout out to all of um, Mr. Masiva's fans who are following on Facebook. Three million, th more than three million people are watching this live, I'm sure. Um, so I'd like to, I'm just gonna have a, um, open up with a couple of questions uh, for Strive, and then we'll, we'll um, uh, open up to the audience um, for, for you to engage in an interactive discussion. So, you know, Strive, um, one of the things that in my daily life, I work with a lot of young people. Right? I'm, you know, we're trying to train about three million uh, African leaders over the next couple of decades. And so I often ask these young people what they want to do. Um, what, in what ways do they want to lead and be entrepreneurs? And they, 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 they throw out terms like they want to build the next blockchain startup, or they talk about fintech, or they want to build apps and um, maybe some of them want to do fashion. But very few of them tell me that they want to, to go into agriculture. Um, and here we are talking about agriculture. And here we have, you know, many young people in the room. So 
what is your message to young people? Why does agriculture matter? How, what is your, what would you say to the people in this room about why they should even consider this in, in their future? Great, uh, thanks, thanks, Fred. I mean, I'm being interviewed by Fred. Hey, guys, this is this is a big deal. Eh? <laughs> if you're from Africa, you know this is a big deal. Thank you, Fred, for the privilege. You know. Uh, one of our colleagues on AGRA, who was vice president of AGRA, uh, Akina Deshina, who now runs um, the African Development Bank, always would correct you if you said agriculture. He would say agribusiness. Okay? We need to move on from agriculture. Agribusiness. Okay, you're in blockchain. Bring it to agribusiness, okay? You are in, uh, your, you, whatever it is you are doing, okay? The opportunity in agribusiness is the greatest entrepreneurship opportunity in Africa. Let me tell you guys, if you don't take it, huh, they're going to come and take it. It's up to you. <laughs> no one is going to, you know, nature was, I heard that Einstein was here, so maybe I'll steal something from, the, from one of these great scientists. Nature abhors a vacuum, so does entrepreneurship, okay? This is, a, this is the greatest entrepreneurial opportunity. So it really, this great value chain that we, Africa's agriculture needs young people to come and increase the productivity levels. Okay, so bring whatever it is you have. Let's use it. Great, thank you. So, it's the greatest opportunity of, our, of this century. You heard it very much from the man. And if anyone knows about business, it's Mr. Masiwa. He knew, he recognized trends 20 years ago when the mobile phone was coming out. Would you say that agriculture is the next big thing? Oh, it's bigger. Look, uh, the, the, you know the numbers, Fred. Okay, by the turn of this century, 40% of the world's population will be African. Okay? Just, just think about that. Uh, the, most of our cities that today are sitting on under 50%, we've got under 50% urbanization, sit, there will be cities the size of Lagos today there'll be 10, 15 major cities of that size around Africa. Okay? That is an opportunity for this generation. Providing food security, providing food for new urban cities that will emerge. How can that not be a great opportunity? So, let's just get to a bit more detail. You teach a lot about entrepreneurship on your, on your Facebook page. Um, today, over 70% of the cocoa is grown in Ghana and Ivory Coast. I come from Ghana. But when I travel around the world, I have never seen a Ghanaian chocolate brand. I buy Lindt from Switzerland and Nestle. Um, what is the one in Germany? Kinder. Don't go there, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we, we start talking about Unilever and, uh, and Nestle and so forth. What's okay. it going to take to get an African chocolate brand on the scale of a Nestle or a or Lindt? Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. Entrepreneurship. Okay. But so, how? So, so it's the, the answer is not to go out and regulate and say, no, you, you cannot, you, you have to... Uh, uh, do processing and what have you. Our focus is to, fo is to get the entrepreneurs moving. It is the entrepreneurs in Africa who will go out and create our brands in using uh, this raw material. Of course, we need good policy. Where's the president? Is he still here? President, don't forget the policies for us. But, but in, in reality... It's going to be about driving entrepreneurship and innovation, a whole new mindset, which is what I try to talk about. Hmm. The last question before I turn over to the audience. Um, you know, in Africa, when you solve one issue, 
it normally has many, many ripple effects. Um, very few things can be seen in isolation. Right? There's so many things that are interconnected. So, from in your opinion, Strive, what are all the different opportunities that are going to be unlocked if we unlock this potential in, agri in agriculture that we have? As I said before, we can keep looking at those numbers. It's all in the numbers. This is what I'm always saying to our entrepreneurs. Look at the numbers. 60% of the world's unutilized agricultural land is in Africa. Okay? We're just opening up African trade. You know, we've spent uh, the last... You, you and I have been involved in that little bit about the continental free trade area. Opening up trade between African countries. The lowest trade, if you look at intra-American trade, intra-European trade, Asian trade, they're all over, seven, of, all over 50%. Africa, 15%. Just opening up uh, the movement of agricultural product in Africa. And here, I'm, I'm going beyond just uh, uh, arable land. What about our rivers, our lakes, our fisheries, our hus animal husbandry? All that is just an opportunity waiting to be opened up. So, so the, the, for, for us to really uh, get our continent moving, both to meet the, the demographic challenge that is emerging before us, and to turn it into a dividend. We're gonna really have to raise our game. And it also begins with skills development where you are. I mean, this man is, has the ambition to develop, to educate three million people in his institutions at, one, at a given time, not in his lifetime. And he's well on his way to do it. So you, you know what it means. Thank you, sir. I'd like to now open up for um, questions from, from the audience. And if I may ask, please uh, stand when, you, uh, uh, if, you know, when I call on you um, so that you can be seen by the cameras and then also introduce yourself um, before you ask your question. So um, I think the, the, if there's a question here. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mas Mr. Strive Masiwa. It's really an opportunity um, to attend this. So my name is Aneta Dong from Uganda, but from currently at a, a PhD student with Center for Development Research. Um, so Mr. Strive, I'm just following up on one of the observations that you made in Mali. Um, you said um, in Mali, when, when you went with, um, with Mr. Kofi, the people that you saw participate in agriculture were rural women. So uh, my question is, that what is it? What is it that we should do to enhance the role of rural women in the transformation of, of the agriculture that we want to see as Africa? Thank you. Uh, th th thank you for that great question. Um, the women produce 70% of the food that we eat in Africa, yet they don't own the land. Land rights is a fundamental piece, but not only giving them access to land, but giving them the security that comes with land. And as you know, I mean, in 54 countries, it's, there are many, many different um, approaches to it. You've got Rwanda at one extreme, to whom if you go into a Rwandan village, and I was in a Rwandan village recently, the women came out and showed me their title deeds to their land. Uh, to others that say, well, look, you know, you are interfering with our culture. But even if you cannot deliver to them a piece of paper that says this is your right, there are many ways by which we can approach empowerment of women. We've got to empower young girls. We've got to do more to educate girls. We, the greatest multiplier to economic growth in Africa is to educate the girl child, number one. Nothing will give us 
a better return on our growth than that. So we've got to ensure that girls have access to education all the way, not where they can drop out at 14 and 15 and get married. That's not going to help us. We want more Annies with PhDs. Okay? And that's, that's my ground zero. More Annies with PhDs. You heard that. Um, okay, let's take a couple of questions. Um, so, gentlemen, there. Can we get the microphone to please? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, much appreciate, uh, appreciating your talk. Uh, my name is Antonio Gola, a uh, PhD student at the University of Bonn. Uh, I would l just like to know from you, because you, you talked about uh, uh, the, uh, the role of increasing productivity of smallholder farmers, and you talked about uh, uh, agricultural revolution in Africa, which I agree. But I would like to know from you uh, uh, the role of education especially African education system, because uh, uh, I think the African education system focuses more on learning European history and all that. Uh, so may I know from you uh, your thoughts on the role of African education system in agriculture? That is one. And then number two, uh, my second question would be on the role of uh, what I would call the regimes of translation, for example, uh, uh, change of political leadership from one political leader to another, uh, like the president, a case study of Tanzania, uh, looking at the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor uh, of Tanzania, which was actually the brainchild of uh, President Jaka Kikwete. Now, uh, there's another president who is actually not for that particular uh, uh, agricultural scheme. So what would you say about the role of different regimes? Because uh, I think that something really important as well. Thank you. Okay. Let me, oh, sorry, Fred, you're gonna ask. Should we just take a couple more questions and then you can Sure, make? sure, yeah. carry on. Let's have uh, the, the young lady. Young-ish. <laughs> young so I'm Mati Dandlovu, an alumna of the Kofi Annan Business Schools Foundation, um, and I'm also a fellow Zimbabwean. Currently, I work uh, for a venture capital fund, and I'm interested, Mr. Masiwa, in your views but on the nexus between technology and agriculture. How can um, telecoms companies like Econet be used as a platform to amplify the impact of agribusiness on the African continent? Are you actively investing in tech-fired agricultural uh, ventures? Thank you. Let me start with my favorite question. I mean, uh, <laughs> my fellow Zimbabwean. There are 1.5 million smallholder farmers in Zimbabwe. Did you know EcoPharma, our technology platform for smallholder farmers, has 1 million of them using our services every day? But they, 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 on that platform, they get information on what to grow, where to grow, tips on agriculture, and I want to do more. I wish I could get the same statistics out of that country called Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> then I will overtake Aliko. <laughs> so, so, you know, agriculture, technology in agriculture is central to a achieving um, Productivity. Uh, you 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 heard uh, that story about one tractor in five six countries. You went to Stefan, one tractor. Okay. Before we talk about blockchain, how about some tractors? <laughs> okay, okay. Because that rural African woman whom we talked about is got a hoe. Don't take pictures of her and romanticize it. Because it's a terrible tragedy in the 21st century to assign somebody to produce food with a hoe. It belongs in the Berlin Museum. Better still, the African Museum. So, you know, we need to see technology at play in agricultural transformation. Um, so, I'm, I'm fully much in support of that. So whether it's telecommunications technology, 
blockchain technologies, storage technologies. We're calling on young people to come and solve the problem of food waste. Because there's nothing more tragic than having such a low productivity on food production, only to lose 40% of it through waste. That too, we, we need new solutions for storage and movement of, 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 uh, of, of uh, food. And while I'm at it, I will, I'll not address Tanzanian politics. I, I, I watch CNN, so I watch more American politics. <laughs> As, I'm only kidding, but you know, you are going to be, the question you've asked, you are better, prepared, you are better positioned to answer it because you are from Tanzania. So I will not be, I will not, I will not engage on that. Let me rather talk about the African education system for agriculture. Uh, if, you, if you, in Agra, for instance, we realized that if we were going to see increased productivity, particularly around crops that are traditional to our own food, there's no big international food company that's going to come and produce sorghum and millet and our cassava. So we've, we've invested in building and supporting African entrepreneurs start seed companies. But before you can do that, you need a PhD in, 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 in the seed sector. So guess what? We've produced over 500 PhDs and MSCs in the seed industry. Looking at ways to improve soil health, looking at ways to improve seed systems, okay, to meet the requirements of our own people and the orphan uh, crops that we have to maintain our own traditional seed systems. Not by uh, playing and engineering with them, no. We don't need to get into all that. We'll leave it to the scientists elsewhere. Our focus is how do we apply science to improve all aspects of, um, of, of um, agriculture, which means we need agriculture economists. We need to see more, uh, so it's not just about scientists. We want to see every aspect of what drives the agricultural uh, a food chain. So that's on on on, on education, right? Fred? Yeah, we'll take on a few more questions. Okay. This side. Everyone wow. wants to ask you a question. Right. So suddenly, no, people did I say something. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. My name is Joshua. I'm from Ghana as well. Uh, really nice to see you and meet you in person. Um, Strive. Uh, it's really impressive what you open our mindsets to with the agricultural revolution in Africa now. And there's no doubt about the relation with technology and agriculture. And I work with SMEs a lot in Accra and also in rural areas. And I mean, there are two projects which are really interesting. One consolidating farmers, smallholder farmers, so they can have access to financing. And another one is also like what you said in Mali, having access to tractors. But then they don't have the money, but if you're able to move one tractor to one place and you have a shared cost for multiple farmers, that is easy, and we're just doing this through up and stuff like that. That is all true, and you talk about trade within Africa. The fundamental thing which you mentioned was about policy. And usually SMEs don't have that much power to influence policy. So my question to you as an economic giant would be how do we rely also on your influence and other key players like you in the African context to drive policy change? And is this something that can come from economic giants like you or it should be a radical also revolution of SMEs and smallholder people just hit on the street and going the radical way to say, this is what we need. Thank you. Well, um, I think we should invite you to come and work for Agra because that's exactly what we're trying to do. You don't need a giant. I'm not a giant. I'm a little guy. Can't you see? <laughs> So th this is exactly what Kofi Annan had in the creation of Agra, okay? How do we advocate for the SMEs? Remember I said agribusiness. 
So the SMEs we envisaged in agribusiness, whether they are working at the farm level of producing food or they are in some aspect of it. You, you're a smart guy. You're now already telling me that you're going to have Uber Tractor now. Okay, why not? Go develop the app and let's have an Uber Tractor so that we can go around a hundred smallholder farmers so that when he comes, we'll have 10 tractors, okay? So, so this is an application of technology. And by the way, there are young entrepreneurs in Africa already working in that area, okay? So, but uh, you mentioned policy. It's critical. The whole agri model it is designed to work with governments in Africa. They are the ones who are working in the policy area, uh, helping them work through their own national policies around agriculture, sharing best practices. It, that's why we need even former ministers. And by the way, on the Agra board, we have former ministers, former prime ministers, former presidents, the for, head, former head of IFAD, the former head of World Food Program, former head of Rockefeller Foundation. That's what combined together makes the giant you are talking about, not this little guy here at the front, okay? <laughs> but thanks for the question. Just a couple more questions. And then that them at the back. This, yeah. this. Hello. Okay, um, you go first. You go okay, ahead. sorry. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Malik. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, I'm a master's student from the University of Hohenheim in Stuttgart. Um, actually, my question is actually um, very similar to what he asked, but uh, I'm thinking um, that there are a lot of papers on policy reforms in the agricultural sector for Africa, and it doesn't look like the, the people in government do not know this. It's like they know, but um, they are not backing it the right way. The implementation is the problem. So my question would be, what is AGRA doing to make the governments of African countries um, really ready to implement those policies and make them work? Thank you. You, you know Akina Deshina, right? Yes. He was the vice president of AGRA. So when we couldn't get the government to listen, we, we put the minister there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank and you. boy, didn't he do some great stuff. Uh, you agree, huh? He was an amazing agriculture minister, but I'm kidding. Of course, let me give, let me give a practical example from Nigeria, your great country, okay? Um, 70% of the people are, are engaged in agriculture. 1% of the bank lending was going to agriculture. 1%. Okay? So, as Agra, when uh, Sanusi was uh, governor, we actually went as the Agra board. And we had a meeting with the, the ministers. Actually, they came. We had a meeting with... Um, uh, the governors, the governor of the central bank, the minister of agriculture, all the bank presidents, and they said they'd never met in that format before. And guess what? When we left, they committed $3 billion to agriculture. How about that? That's what we do as an accelerator, as Agra, okay? Bringing the players together into a room to see how we can, we don't necessarily hit people on the head because it doesn't always have the result. Sometimes it does, but <laughs> I'm talking, you don't go throw stones now. Uh, but what I'm saying is we can sometimes exchange ideas by bring, coming in as a trusted third party into a conversation. I remember once traveling to Nigeria with Dr. Judith Rodin when she was head of, um, uh, when she was head of the Rockefeller Foundation. And we met with the entire Economic Council of Nigeria. To and we discussed these kind of ideas. And they were engaged. And change comes through over time. Uh, I was very hopeful. 
and remain so. You're going to see great things in Nigeria. Thank you. I'm going to take three questions from, uh, I'd like the next two questions at least to be from women. <laughs> hmm? There. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the insightful event. Um, I'm Dorothy from Uganda. I'm a PhD student at ZEF. And I have a number of issues when it comes to youth involvement in agriculture. Of course, I've worked with youth, youth for some time. One of the key issues is that um, the youth are willing to join agriculture, but there are a number of uh, bottlenecks to that. One of the key issues is access to finance, access to credit, access to land, access to all the production inputs. And there comes in the issue of gov government will. How are our governments willing to support the youth to be involved in agriculture so that we make agriculture cool for the youth, as it's always termed? Then the other issues about the programs, there are a number of programs that are being implemented. One of them is Enable Youth. Uh, it has been so far, the implementation has started in Nigeria, Ghana, and so far they have started a little bit of it in Uganda. But the issue is that the funding that goes to such programs 50% of the funding ends up in administration costs, whereby a lot of the funds go to, go to administration and a little bit goes to corruption. <laughs> the office is supposed to implement, just swindle the funds all around, and we end up not benefiting from such programs in developing the youth and, tr and transforming agriculture. How do we come in as researchers, as scientists, as policy makers, and as people in this room to improve the implementation of these programs. Thank you so much. Can I just hold, let's take a couple more questions. Let's, women, two. Um, and someone from the back as well. Who hasn't, is there a woman back there? Okay, there? Okay, you go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here today to hear this talk. Uh, I'm called Jen Katsime from Uganda. And Something's I'm going on here. Did you hear? <laughs> All these women from Uganda. <laughs> All doing PhDs. This yeah, awesome. Uh, thank you. I'm doing a PhD in computer science at Humboldt University here in Berlin. Uh, I'm glad you talked about uh, food waste. Um, I'm very passionate about developing mobile applications for low resource settings, especially in health and agriculture. But the problem we have is, like you said, it's women who are doing most of this agriculture. When we take out these um, applications, well train them to use it, but the time comes when they are producing like perishable products Using these uh, applications, they cannot market the perishable products within the short time, uh, so they, they, they actually end up getting wasted. So my question is, does AGRA have uh, a strong focus on, waste, on uh, food waste management, especially for perishable um, products? And uh, I would like to note that as young people, we are ready to go back home and actually do agriculture. But as we all know, no young person who has gone to university wants to go to the garden with the hoe, and uh, most of them actually prefer white collar jobs. So um, while you call us to go home, I think uh, the focus would be on how to um, help us turn agriculture into the white collar jobs that we are looking for. Thank you very much. I, well, I can't promise about agriculture being a white collar job. <laughs> no, what I mean is... <laughs> no, no, I hear you. Don't worry. Let me come back. Let me... Uh, we take one more question. One more question, and then, yeah. And then, and then I will answer, and then the answer the three. question. Yeah, okay. I'm Dorcas from Ghana, and um, I'm a master's student in... Um, studying cultural diplomacy and um, international relations. So my questions are two. I'm asking one for uh, my colleagues. One also. question, please, only. Choose your no. best one. Choose okay. a question. One question. Okay, so, um, yeah, to 
Mr. Strive. I want to ask, do you think that African socialism, which was brought about by Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and uh, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, is better suited to be able to produce, to be able to produce progressive government policies to help African development? And um, I would like Thank to just you. please switch it in. So with cultural diplomacy also, how can that improve um, agriculture with the made in Ghana goods, for instance, like what um, he said that you don't see Ghanaian chocolate in, the, in Europe or in any other market. So how can we also help, how can Agra help sure. with, um, yeah. I wish Agra could be all things to all men, you know. I wish I, I wish I could do a review of African socialism for you, but wrong guy. <laughs> you know, uh, let me come, let me just kind of pick off a few things from the four comments that have come through. And I may not necessarily cover everything that you picked up. African youth. Um, they are obviously center to anything we do in agriculture. The average age of Africa is 19. So whatever it is we are going to do about the future of Africa, we have to start thinking about the youth. Whether you look at that statistic as how many are under 30, the reality is the majority of Africa's population is young people. For us to turn that into a demographic dividend. It's not going to happen by itself. We have to focus on skills development across Africa. A major skills development with mass entrepreneurship on a scale the world hasn't seen, to be honest with you, because we have to create jobs. And agriculture gives us an opportunity, it's not the panacea for everything, but there is an opportunity given to us through agriculture. That's what I wanted to say about youth, not necessarily addressing it the way you, 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 you put it to me. You talked about the challenges associated with implementation. The, you talked about issues of things like corruption, they are there. And technology also offers us an opportunity to address things like corruption. I give the example of Dr. Akina Deshina when he went to Nigeria. And he used mobile wallets to make disbursements directly to smallholder farms. Others are beginning to use things like blockchain to trace the movement of agricultural product. Uh, there are so many things you can, even just social media, exposing corruption, exposing. So let us use all the tools at our disposal to deal with corruption. Because for what, given our challenge, corruption is the greatest tragedy that we see. But we mustn't become consumed over it. Okay? We can, th there are good uh, tools out there of transparency, running our organizations efficiently. We talk of Agra, we, have, we deal with all sorts of donors. And the key to how an institution like that operates is to ensure there is no corruption in the way resources are used and the percentage, we set specific percentages of how much of our resources will be applied to administration so that it's not frittered away. And there's constant monitoring, evaluation, auditing, and so forth. Then my friend there talked about food waste. It's again, and you asked about Agra's work in food waste. Just before Dr. Rodin stepped down, as head of uh, Rockefeller Foundation, which is one of the, which is one of the founding donors of uh, Agra, we approved a massive program, probably the largest ever, just to address food waste. Because we realized that it's one thing to talk about increasing yield and 
prove seeds and so forth, if the food is then wasted because it perishes too quickly, then what are we doing? So we look, we, we are, Agra is putting resources into finding solutions for locally based storage methods that allow for food not to perish. Uh, but there is a lot more work we need to do with cold chain and ensuring that food, are get, food is getting to urban markets and can be stored and so forth. Transport system, it's complex. And our mandate is not that wide as Agra, but to the extent that we can bring, uh, put a searchlight on it and bring partners like uh, the German government here to help us in areas like this, we will definitely be looking to it. But again, it's a challenge to you scientists here. Get to it. Food waste. Let's cut it in half. I guess, Fred, we're coming close to the end here. Yep. So, Dorcas well, and African socialism. Did I answer that? No, you didn't. <laughs> I don't know anything about African socialism, Dorcas. You know that. I'm a capitalist. <laughs> I'm here to make money. <laughs> Listen, I don't... Uh, and I, I never met Kwame Nkrumah, but I love Kwame Nkrumah. I love uh, Julius Nyerere. He did a great job in helping to liberate my own country. It was their generation. They had their mission, which was to decolonize us and to bring us together. Julius Nyerere was asked at the end of his life, about, what did you do about the economy? He said, that wasn't my job. I came to decolonize the country. It's your job. So we don't have to spend time thinking about socialism or whatever ism is out there. Let's talk about how we raise the prosperity of our people in an inclusive way. That's easy to understand. That is our mission in this generation. Thank you. So we'll take two last questions. One is from that gentleman at the back. And then um, I'd like to give a chance to a German student to ask a question as well. Thank and you very we'll much. Uh, my name is Ajayi Opoemi. I'm a master's student here at the University of Applied Sciences. I'm very excited to be here. I'm from Nigeria. And talking about inclusiveness in um, the green revolution that probably we are trying to catch up with. I, I must admit that um, you said something very, very important about us being left behind and having to catch up. But thinking about why youths don't go into agriculture and why we are having more of technological revolution, more in Africa than agricultural revolution, it's all still boiled down on some of the things you mentioned, from financial inclusion, policy uh, to for <coughs> right protection. I want to ask, what's your view on cluster formations? It's because entrepreneurship has to do with scalability, and nobody wants to go into a business that will not last for the next 20 years. So if I'm dedicating my life to agro business. I want to be sure it's something that stands next 20 years. So what is your organization doing in this regard? That would be one. Two is my observation also about Africa uh, having possibility of breaking free, but we have industrialists who are importing agricultural products. I'm from Nigeria. It's a practical example of what I'm talking about. So what's the possibility that government will support young people to be able to do something substantial in this area? Because it's just beyond us really wishing to do some of these things. It goes to how are we going to get to where we want to go. Thank you. Okay, last question. Is there a German student who wants to ask a question? 
Okay, we have one man there. One yeah, man. let's have one or two Germans. <laughs> that guy back there. Good evening. My name is Robert Meyer. I'm from Leipzig University, a PhD student, and uh, also part of SEPT, which is a program that deals with entrepreneurship promotion. Um, I met a couple of years ago a young man. He was owning a shop in Zanzibar. And he was telling me, you know, the government should bring a company to process all these oranges. And actually, this comment stuck my mind because he was asking the government to bring this company. So my question to you as distinguished entrepreneurs, how, what can we do to encourage people to take it on their own, to take the opportunities themselves instead of asking the government to do it? Thank you. Okay, okay last question. You, you've been putting out this woman here. Last question here. No, no, no. This woman, she's been putting her hand up for a long time. Yeah. Can we get the microphone here, please? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Evelyn, and I'm from Nigeria, doing PhD at Center for Development Research. Um, a lot of comments about the challenges to developing the agricultural sector, and I have two questions. First, because I come from Nigeria and I know a few of those challenges. For every agribusiness, we want to maximize our profits. So some of the things that would probably hinder the maximization of profits is because for the African system, we have a lot of scattered agricultural sectors. We have the rural areas where the agriculture is uh, produced, uh, produced, and then we have the urban centers where the market actually exists. So in between the rural sector and the urban sector, we have a lot of infrastructural gap, bad roads, for example. How do um, the farmers or entrepreneurs who are trying to maximize their own profit deal with these very crucial infrastructural challenges without losing their profits? That's one question. Second question is, we talk about things like um, the, the, new, the new trend in bioeconomy which the African agricultural system has a very huge advantage of. We can produce the raw materials, we have the land, we have the resources, we have the cheap labor. Let's use it in quotes. However, for a country like Nigeria that depends on oil exports, how would that country be willing as an alternative to producing uh, fossil-based products, which would not only improve on our environmental sustainability, but also on our economic and inclusive growth for the rural poor. How is this policy incentive going to ma materialize, given that there will be some trade-offs against well, national prosperity and equitable distribution of this wealth? Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to start with you. Don't, don't sit down. You're doing a PhD, right? Yeah, sure. How come you're asking me so many questions? <laughs> you tell me the answers, because that's why you're doing a PhD. <laughs> you're the smart one. If you guys were so smart, OK, you're the best that we have. Come on, guys. Don't ask questions. Answer them. We need you to come home with the answers. That's my challenge to you. I'm not going to answer those questions because you must answer them. <laughs> you must solve these problems. You heard what our friend from Germany said. <laughs> that, that should disturb us. We, we have a governance model in place that says government, 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 government. That's not to say we should let them off the hook. But there's a lot we can do. There's a lot of solutions we can find. If you want to be successful, identify a need and reach out to solve it. All these are just opportunities for us. You may sit, ma'am. <laughs>
You see, we have, that's why we're here. I tell, I'll close the funny story of my grandmother. You see, I studied electrical engineering. And I was away from my home country for, God knows, 20 years or something. So I returned home. And I visit my grandmother who died about two years ago. She was 106 when she died. And she called all the rural women together. And she danced and she said, my grandson is back. You're all going to get electricity. <laughs> I said, grandmother, there's no electricity here. She said, but didn't you go to England? <laughs> you are in Germany. Bring the solutions. And it's not just to you. All those guys on Facebook out there in African universities, Stanford, wherever, our best and brightest are. You see these problems? Seize the moment. Let's solve the problems. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for giving me such a lovely time. God bless you and see you back home, every one of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Strive. Always such an inspiration hearing from you. Thank you very much. So, Time is limiting us. It is really inspiring and motivating. As Mr. Masiwa said, Africa has begun the Green Revolution. I'm challenged tonight. It's up to us, African youth, to finish the business. So I encourage you to continue socializing, connecting, and uh, capitalize on the discussions. From now on, we'll have a reception waiting us outside. But before that, I'm asking African youth to remain here to have a photo with this inspiring motivational speaker. You call it whatever you want. So let's have a group photo, but let's continue discussing, chatting about this important thing. Thank you so much for attending.